Hi, this is the lecture on Ambrose Bierce's Chickamauga, which is a short story um, depicting the one of the last major battles of the Civil War from the perspective of a character who is not the narrator, um, a little boy who is pretending to be a soldier in the woods who never speaks. In fact, I don't think he can speak and he sees things quite dimly. So this is an unreliable perspective um, that Beers is giving us. The question that I pose to you for your homework is to find the themes of symbolism, what kinds of symbolism show up repeatedly in the short story, and then having found those, ask yourself what those symbols add up to and overall, ask yourself, what is Beer saying about war in general and the Civil War specifically? And then how does that compare to what other writers of the time were saying about war? The story is a spectacular story. It is a kind of spectacle. There's a long future ahead of you in literary studies. Um, in looking at and theorizing the concept of the spectacle, there's a theorist named Bakhtin who looks at spectacle in medieval fairs and carnivals. And we see this concept of the spectacle as the underbelly of society written larger than life and magnified. And so that's one, sp one perspective that is being examined in Ambrose Bierce's Chickamauga, the carnival, the circus, the freak show. Um, it's certainly not simple realism. If we go back to the debates that James and Howells and Norris was, were having, we see that although this does depict a day in the life of a little boy and one of the darkest chapters in American history, it's not real. It's, the, it's imbued with a sort of magic perspective that the spectacle brings about. And it, the way it's achieved is there's an uncanny grotesqueness about it. The uncanny means out of body or separate from body, and the grotesque is the over-the-top depiction of um, the seedy part of life, of death, dying, and all those things in between. And if you look at the symbolic um, patterns, students often first notice that the little boy is a soldier. He's playing at war. And so what we see is gender play. Um, he's been gendered from an early age. He has swords. He has war books. Surely there are not very many books in this little farmhouse. But he has been raised in his early life to be a soldier. His history going back through his father, his ancestry, is of conquest. And this is a romanticized notion of conquest. To the victor go the spoils. By now, we have a suspicious view of conquest. We're concerned about those who do who are not victorious. We are concerned about the ethics of victory. But this little boy is representative of a certain type of humanity, a certain place in human understanding um, that is only concerned with conquest, and it's a fantasy. Beers uses the limited perspective of the little mute boy to show the fantasy of the victory inherent in conquest. It's a confused little boy. He is afraid of things he shouldn't be afraid of and not afraid of things that he should be afraid of. And this is a kind of inversion where the opposite of what you expect to happen happens. The opposite of what you expect to mean have meaning. It, the author puts meaning in the opposite way that, it, that you expect it to be. And you see this with the rabbit and the bear. The little boy is afraid of the rabbit, but not afraid of the bear. And these are both imagined creatures. In his world, in his environment, he's kind of aware that he's fantasizing. But when the wounded soldiers start appearing, 
he can't really incorporate them into his fantasy world. What would you expect to be moving in the woods? Well, animals, so what kinds of animals? Rabbits and bears, um, not wounded men. And so that dim perspective is continued when you see the fog, lots and lots of fog. The boy is blind and confused. His vision is also compounded by the fact that he's in the forest with the trees. Very often, symbolically, psychologically, archetypally, uh, when a character goes into the forest, it is it goes into the woods, it is to be transformed, to have a life journey, and to come out the other side different, to enter into the subconscious in order to have a revelation and to grow as a character. We see this in Young Goodman Brown quite clearly. However, this little boy is too dim to really have a clear revelation and the trees are just obscure. He is in a dark place of the consciousness where he does not really reach awareness. He learns something at the end, but we're not clear and he's not, he's, he is certainly not a clear storyteller to tell the story that he's learned. Similarly with water, where water usually symbolizes purification, uh, cathartic baptism, um, uh, coming to a new state of renewed and better being, you, you see the soldiers coming to the water side and slaking their thirst but not having strength enough to lift their heads and so they drown. So there's a drowning with the water. The water is a flood. It's a killing water. It's not a, it may be purifying, but it does not result in a better way of being. And so things that often represent a delving into the subconsciousness in order to come up and be better, to grow as a human or to grow as a society in fierce, just result in more confusion. The water is a, a drowning water and it contributes to the fog and the mist, which is a blinding fog and mist. Um, this is a satire against war. Only idiots would defend the glory of war. The romanticization of war is an idiot's dream, seems to be what Beers is saying. And he was a straight shooter. Um, his journalism um, was very, very harsh and biting and stinging. So I'm not overstating what he's claiming here by using the word idiot. Although this little boy seems to have some sort of an instinct for war, he seems to have revelations, but he can't tell the difference between animals and people. The wounded, um, he begins to mark them as circus. In your book on page 140, you see something in this, something too perhaps in their grotesque attitudes and movements. This is the bottom of 139 and then the top of 140 reminded him of the painted clown whom he had seen last summer in the circus and he laughed as he watched them but on and ever on they crept these maimed and bleeding men as heedless as he of the dramatic contrast between his laughter and their own ghastly gravity in this quote you see the dehumanization of the soldiers he can't tell that they are soldiers you see the spectacle of the circus he is wanting to be entertained it is like the entertainment of the guillotine or the entertainment of the hangman's noose, where people used to take picnic, picnics to watch death. It is like the ladies on either side of the North and South gathering on the battleground to witness the battle with picnics and their family in tow. Beers is indicting the entertainment quality of spectacular death. The ghostly imagery that shows up in the story with the fog and the spirits and the half bodies also show the dehumanization of the soldiers. And I'm going to write down a term so that you can see it. The soldiers are also dehumanized when they are compared and um, described as guns and satchels and blankets but we don't get faces and bodies and hearts and this habit of describing a part of something to represent a whole is called synecdoche can you see that s-y-n-e-c-d-o 
C-H-E, synecdoche. And that means when a writer uses a part of something to represent a whole. In this case, you can see that the blankets and the rifles and the portions of the human beings that the boy is able to discern really add up to them being soldiers and only soldiers, not men, not humans. I don't think it's ever clear that the little boy recognizes that the soldiers are men. Just like in Synecdoche, when women are described by their breast or by um, their, um, their sexuality rather than by their whole persons, that would be a a feminist reading of the problems with synecdoche. Good synecdoche might represent a person with their hands or their heart or their face, their whole humanity. In the end, we go back to the animal inner imagery. When he has a kind of revelation, he follows the fire, the smoke again, including his vision, back to his home, and he sees that his home is destroyed and his mother is murdered. The child moved his little hands, also images of smallness, um, which evoke for me a helplessness as well as a lack of knowing um, or throughout the story. The child moved his little hands, making wild and certain gestures. He uttered a series of inarticulate and indescribable cries, something between the chattering of an ape and the gobbling of a turkey. He is not fully human either. He's lost his humanity if he had it. A startling, soulless, unholy sound, the language of a devil. He was a deaf mute. Had he been a deaf mute? Did he become a deaf mute? Did he lose the capacity to speak by witnessing such atrocity? Then he stood motionless with quivering lips, looking down upon the rat. And it's as if Beers is saying, this is what mankind has come to, and this is the reaction. The only appropriate reaction is dumbfounded horror at the atrocities of war. Have you ever visited Chickamauga up in Tennessee? I went up there with the children and it is very ghostly and intentionally so. The markers um, throughout the landscape, um, there's a quietude there, um, a solemn remembrance even this many years later. Ambrose uh, Pierce was writing from experience fairly soon after uh, the events of the Civil War. So he does not romanticize the war in victory. There is some gross realism, some graphic, uh, grotesque detail. But it is romantic in this larger sense of what is the meaning of mankind, what is the role that we have to play. It looks at um, I think it invites us to be better and it's romantic in that way and naturalist in the way that it looks at how we are determined by our environment and by the nurture um, that we get from our parents. We are determined by what we are taught, how we are gendered. In this case, this boy is gendered to be a soldier. That's all he knows. And uh, yet, um, he sees this world very dimly. Um, Beers, however, was not necessarily representative of the opinions of most war writers at the time. It became very popular after the Civil War to romanticize the war, to lift up our soldiers. Um, memoirs, your introduction tells you about the memoir of, of Grant becoming very, very popular. We wanted heroes, we still needed heroes in the American imagination, and the satirical, cynical approach of Beers was not the most representative approach criticizing the dehumanizing spectacle of war.